Confirmation is one of my favorite times of the year. The kids start coming uh, to meet with me towards the end of January. We meet for about three months. And you know, this is on the parents also because these kids don't drive. So we've got parents who are committed to this also, who bring their children every week, parents and grandparents, bring their kiddos every week. And we talk about all the things that you would think we talk about. We talk about the Bible, we talk about creation, sin, death. We talk about the Trinity, God, the Holy Spirit. We talk about Jesus, his life, his ministry, his death, the resurrection. We talk about the Methodist Church. We have a whole hour one week where we talk about the polity of the United Methodist Church, which you can imagine is always their favorite day. I mean, how could that not be, right? <laughs> but actually, they ask really good questions. They really do. And we talk about Christian life and practices and what discipleship means. We talk about all of these things, and I think one of the most important things that we talk about alongside every one of these topics is that this confirmation isn't like graduation. It's not like now they know everything there is to know about being Christian and they're done and they're perfect disciples in the world. Confirmation isn't about that. Confirmation is really the beginning of their journey. What they're doing when they're being confirmed and when they, they stand and they say the I do's and I will is they're claiming their Christian discipleship for themselves. They're saying before today, my parents brought me to church, my grandparents brought me to church. The primary responsibility of their discipleship wasn't on them, it was on the people around them. But as of today, they've taken on that responsibility for themselves. Today is the day that their discipleship truly starts. And so as I was going through the lectionary readings for this week and came upon the story of the disciples and Thomas, they were facing that same moment in their lives. They were facing the moment in which their discipleship really started. This is the night of the resurrection. I mean, this is brand new. These, these guys have been through it, right? They've seen the man who they thought to be the Messiah, arrested, beaten, tortured, killed, and buried. And so we find them sitting in a locked room, afraid. This isn't really the picture of discipleship that we had hoped for in this group. I'm sure this isn't the picture of discipleship that would have been ideal in Jesus' eyes, and yet, when Jesus shows up, he doesn't chastise them, he doesn't berate them, he doesn't show disappointment, he simply says, peace be with you. And then he shows them the proof of who he is. He meets them where they are in their fear and says, look, I'm here. He knows what they need in order to, to embrace confidence and certainty in who they are and what they're being asked to do. He breathes the Holy Spirit out upon them, giving them the power to do what they're going to need to do. Jesus meets them where they are. Jesus knows that today, as these students claim their discipleship for themselves and seek to be disciples in the world, that there are going to be moments where they need Jesus to meet them where they are. One of the things I talk about with the students is that questions are good and okay. And we live in a culture in which oftentimes we're made to feel bad if we don't have like a perfect faith and an absolute confident faith all of the time. And the reality is, we're going to have really great moments in our spiritual lives. We're going to have really strong and empowering moments in our walk with Christ. And we're also going to have moments where we're scared and when we doubt and when we're confused and don't understand. And I repeatedly say to them that that's okay. That's okay. Look at these disciples. They knew Jesus better than anyone else. They had spent years with him. They shouldn't have had any doubts. They shouldn't have had any confusion. He told them what to expect, and yet they did. If the disciples are gonna have those moments, having spent years of their lives with him, we're gonna have those moments also. You guys are gonna have those moments. And it's okay, because what we learn from the scripture reading today is that Jesus is gonna show up for you in those moments. The disciples hadn't stopped looking for Jesus. 
They hadn't run away and gone home and said, okay, this is it. They were still together. They're in a room together. You know what they're talking about. They're talking about what's going on. What are we going to do next? What is, is the next step and what really just happened? They're still pursuing God. They're still pursuing what it is that Jesus has been leading them to pursue. And then we see Thomas, who wasn't there and didn't get to see Jesus appear the first time. And, you know, Jesus, uh, excuse me, Thomas is given a, a bad rap here as being doubting Thomas. But I want to I step back because we start these, these passages always, you know, in set stories. But I want to read back to John 20, 18 and tell you what the last thing that we see being said to the disciples before we see them in this room Mary Magdalene has just encountered Christ, risen and whole in front of her. And she runs and tells the disciples. And in verse 18, we have Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And their response was to lock themselves in a room and be scared. They're not really very different from Thomas at all, who said, I need to see for myself or I won't believe. Mary told them. They needed to see for themselves so that they could have full faith and belief. And Jesus met them there. So when Thomas is there with them a week later and receives this moment that he needs, that Jesus knows he needs, of Jesus appearing to him, Jesus doesn't say, Thomas, too bad, so sad, you missed out, now you're out. Right? He doesn't do that. He says, do you need to see? Do you need to touch me? It's okay. You can touch me. Here I am. And Thomas is given so much in that moment because he's not just given certainty that Jesus has risen. In that moment, he says, my Lord, my God. In that moment, Thomas receives the full certainty, not only that Jesus has risen, but that Jesus is who he has claimed to be. He's God among them. He is the Messiah. He is everything. Jesus showed up. And I think part of the reason Thomas had this opportunity is like the other disciples, he hadn't given up and gone home. He continued seeking Christ. He wasn't desiring doubt. It was simply his reality. And he fought that doubt by sticking with what he knew. He stuck with the community that had given him assurance and companionship and all of these incredibly faith-filled, grace-filled, miraculous moments in the last years of his life. He stuck with them for that week. Didn't go home. He didn't give up. Right? Just like the disciples after Mary told them, even though they were still fear fearful, even though they locked themselves in the room, they stuck together. Another thing that I talk to these kids a lot about is community. Community is important. The communities that we choose will dictate our our beliefs often. They will dictate the kinds of things we choose to do or don't do. They oftentimes influence the way we feel about ourselves, the world, the families that we live in. Thomas stuck with his community, a community that he knew was faith-filled and Christ-seeking and God-seeking. And Jesus showed up. Jesus shows up. We call him Doubting Thomas, but the reality is, is over and over again in the Bible we see people of doubt, not because they defy faith, but because they're struggling. John the Baptist, who more than anybody else maybe, should have really had whole confidence, constant confidence in who Jesus was, right? From the moment Jesus walks onto the scene, this is the Messiah, this is the guy, here he is. He gets the opportunity, the, the incredible opportunity to baptize Jesus, even though he tries not to, even though he says, no, you're the one who should be baptizing me. I'm not worthy. I'm not even worthy to tie the thong on your sandal, untie the thong on your sandal. And Jesus says, nope, we're going to do it this way. John baptizes Jesus, who he has recognized as the Messiah, experiences the moment where the, the Holy Spirit is pulled, poured out on Jesus, and, and we hear God say, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. How can John the Baptist doubt? But life is hard and scary. And later, John the Baptist finds himself in prison. And the ministry of Jesus 
isn't going the way John expected it to go. And so he sends word to Jesus, word that's filled with doubt. Are you the one? Or am I waiting for someone who's going to come after you? He's not expressing anger or, or anything. He's simply saying, I, 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 did I get this wrong? Did I get this wrong? And he sends his disciples to go ask Jesus this. And Jesus doesn't say, are you kidding me? How dare you ask this? He doesn't ignore those disciples. What he does is say, basically, come here. And in front of those disciples of John the Baptist, he raises the dead. He gives the blind sight, the deaf hearing. He performs miracles. And then he says to them, go back and tell him what you saw. Reassure him that I'm who he believes me to be. It's going to be okay. When we seek Jesus, he shows up. Our doubt doesn't determine Jesus' reaction to us. Our seeking him determines that reaction. I would even argue that sometimes our seeking doesn't determine Jesus' reaction to us. I think of Saul and his experience, his encounter with the risen Lord, Saul certainly wasn't seeking Jesus. But Jesus showed up. Doubt is okay. Just keep looking for Jesus in that doubt. He'll give us what we need to achieve full faith when we seek him. Over and over again. He does this in his life, in his ministry, in his mission, in his death, in his resurrection. That was for every single one of us those who were sure and those who doubted. Think about the two men on the cross on either side of him. One was sure and one doubted. But Jesus went to the cross for both of them and for all of us. And here's, I think, the trick. It's easy now for us to identify with Thomas, right? My doubt is okay. It's, it's common human experience. Keep seeking Christ in this doubt. But then I, I want to flip it around on you a little bit and remind you that as the Father sent me, so I send you. We aren't just called to be the disciples and the Thomases in this story. We're called actually to do what Jesus does for them in this story. We are called to show up for the people who are doubting and the people who are struggling. And we are called not to belittle them or berate them or make them feel small in their faith. We're called to meet them where they are, give them what they need to grow in their relationship with God, to see who God really is and experience the fullness of that faith and that Christian life. So, guys, just like these disciples on the night of Jesus' resurrection, we're faced now with the moment. You guys are faced with the moment. And really, let's, let's be true. Every morning that we wake up, we're faced with this. Our discipleship starts every day new. Some days are full of faith and confidence. Some days are full of fear and uncertainty. But keep walking that walk. Stick with the community. Stick with the experiences. Stick with what you know to have spoken to you about God. And Jesus is going to show up with you on that walk and give you what you need. Amen.